Amen. Okay, tonight we're going to jump into Genesis chapter 12. But we're going to continue where we left off last week. We read the first couple verses there in chapter 12. Uh, and we're going to read those again. And our goal tonight is to cover chapter 12 and chapter 13. And I believe we'll be able to do that. But basically, where we are in Genesis is the transitional period in the narrative of Genesis where we are going from primeval history, which is basically from creation to the Tower of Babel, into God choosing to himself or for himself a people who will develop and grow into a nation that ultimately is going to be the focus of the rest of what we call the Old Testament all the way up until Christ comes and God is going to use this single ethnic group of people, the Hebrew people, as He has chosen them to be His people, He is going to use them to basically unfold the plan of redemption. And there are a couple things that He's going to accomplish primarily with those people. And first of all, He is going to choose them uh, to be the people that bring and deliver the entire canon of Scripture. Okay, so God is going to use them to give us the Word of God. And it is from this event, the Exodus event, which we're going to eventually get to when we go through uh, and get into the book of Exodus, but it is those people that is the original audience of this writing. Okay, Genesis is for the Israelite people. It is basically a history that basically shows where they came from and how God chose them. And so basically you have from Genesis 12 on through the rest of the Old Testament being centered on Abraham whom God chose and Abraham's descendants. Now we're going to see more about the calling of Abraham how he was called from the east to, and called to the land of Canaan. And we're going to see some parallels with that today. So we're going to jump in. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. Now, if we go over to our map, we'll see that the original call took place probably in this area, Ur, in Mesopotamia, near, Ma near Babylon. And the original call of Abram probably happened sometime after the Tower of Babel. If you remember, Abram was somewhere around 40 years of age when the Tower of Babel event happened. God dispersed the people and God chose Abram at that point, called him to go to the land of Canaan and there he's going to use him. Now, what happens is Abram goes from Ur up the Euphrates River and he and his family settle in Haran. And it is from there where Abram is going to leave his father there his father will live 60 years after his death. He's going to leave him finally uh, in Haran. So he lives there for some period of time, as we'll see, long enough to gather wealth and substance, servants, and to build his flocks and his herd and to establish himself uh, with material possessions. And it is from here where we are going to see him being called from. As we continue in verse 2, he said, And I will make of you... A great nation which is significant because again he has turned over the other nations to the other gods the other Elohim and God himself is choosing Abram Abram and he is going to out of Abram make a nation of people who we will come to know as the Hebrew people or the Israelites so this is speaking of them I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. 
In verse 3, he says, I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curseth you, or I will curse him who disdains you. And he says, and in you, or through you, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, why would he make that statement to Abram? Because Abram was chosen as the man whom God would use to develop a nation. And that nation he would use to begin his redemptive plan. So God had to choose people to work through. And God chose Abram. And so every family will be blessed through Abram and his contribution to humanity. And we can see that and celebrate that as Christians, right? Without Abram being used by God and responding in faithfulness and obedience, we would not have anything we celebrate as Christians. God used them to give us the Word of God and to be born amongst them as one of them and to live under the principles that He established with them as a people group. So He says, In you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Because of what Abram done 4,000 years ago, we as Christians can celebrate who we are in Christ and as Galatians says, uh, we are grafted in as descendants of Abram as well, which means we are heirs according to the promise, as Paul says there in Galatians, which means everything you see promised here in Genesis 12 to Abram is promised to us being grafted in as descendants of Abraham through faith in Christ. That's why you see in Paul's writings, he talks about us being in Christ, because Christ is the ultimate seed of Abram. And when we are in Christ, that makes us part of the seed of Abram and heirs according to the promise. So that promise carries over into our life. Those who bless us, God will bless if we're true believers. And those who curse us, God will curse. And... You know, that really relieves us of the burden to vindicate ourselves. Because if we believe what he has said, I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you, uh, there is no vindication needed. You just leave it with God and he sees all, knows all, and he will bring justice in due time. So verse 4 says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. What did he do? He sat there and said, yeah, I believe you, God. No, he left. Abram left Haran, looking at the map. He left Haran at age 75. Remember, he was called earlier after the Tower of Babel. Went from Ur to Haran. But now God is saying, all right, you've been in daddy's shadow long enough. It's time to get on with what I've called you to. you got to think about it. He's 75 and God promised him, I'm going to make of you a great nation well you kind of need to get on with the program you know you're you're getting on up there in years you need to start uh procreating so that god can fulfill his plan so it says and abram departed notice that he responded faithfully in obedience as the lord had spoken unto him and lot went with him and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. Okay, so he goes to Haran and he stays there for a period of time. And God finally says, all right, you need to leave your father's house and go to the land that I've called you to. And Abram responds in faith and he goes and leaves the land of Haran. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that his father tried to persuade him to stay in Haran? It's almost certain that he would have because of the closeness of the families and the interdependence upon one another. Um, I'm sure it was quite evident that the blessing was on Abram. 
God was calling him and choosing him to be a vessel that he would bless and blessing would flow through. And so undoubtedly his father tried to persuade him to stay in Haran. So let me ask you a question. Would it have taken faith for him to obey God and leave his family? Yes. Do you think that was hard for him to do? I mean, we read these stories, but do we ever give any thought to what they faced? Abram has to make a decision. I'm going to either follow God or I'm going to listen to my family. And what does he choose to do? Follow God. Now, let me ask you a question as far as how it relates to our lives. Do you think that God still expects and requires us to listen and obey His voice above all others, including our closest family? How do we know that? It's real simple. Read the Gospels. Jesus makes the statement, if anyone loves his mother or father, brother, sister, spouse, fill in the blank, more than me, he is not worthy of me. Now, let's break that down and understand that. Will God just be satisfied if we do our own thing or listen to our family members if they are speaking to us in a negating way of what God has spoken to us? No. No. Well, I, well, I thought we were under grace though. Jesus, He came so that we could have grace, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of the things that you'll hear today, but the reality is God hasn't changed one bit. He expects us to respond faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully, as we're going to see a perfect example tonight of the imperfection of Abram. We're going to see him stumble a bit. We're going to see some moral issues in his life, but he always comes back to trying to faithfully respond to God, even though he makes mistakes, okay? Uh, but I just wanted to point that out. Abram had issues that he had to deal with. When God calls you, it's going to require faith, and faith is not always just easy, right? It requires tr trust. It, it requires us leaning upon God, and that's exactly what Abram was going to have to do if he was going to experience the blessing that was spoken over his life. Now, let me ask you a question. Was the blessing that God spoke over Abram's life conditional or unconditional? The answer is yes. God was going to choose somebody and establish somebody as the father of faith of whom He would build a nation in and through. That was going to happen. But whether or not it was Abram was dependent upon Abram's response to God. For example... When God said, all right, get out of your daddy's house. If Abram would have stayed in Haran, would God have continued to fulfill what he had spoken and promised over his life? No. Nope. Absolutely not. He could not. Why? Because God cannot reward habitual disobedience. Because habitual disobedience is what? Rebellion. Rebellion. And God cannot work with or honor that. Verse 5, now watch what happens. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, watch this, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So it shows us that he was clearly established in Quran for some period of time because he gained souls, substance in Quran. And he does something very interesting. He takes his nephew slash brother-in-law with him. And the reason why that's pointed out is because he's going to come back into 
uh, this narrative as a figure playing a significant role in what will follow. And so he's mentioned here as being with Abram and Sarai. So they are going to leave Canaan. And how old is he? 75. Here's something that's interesting that you may jot down. Abram is 75 years with his father. Right? God calls him to leave. And Abram spends 25 years without his father or the promised son. Now he has a son in that time, but it's not the promised son. So he has 75 years with his father, 25 years without father or the promised son, and then he has 75 years of his life with the promised son, which is Isaac, which I think is very interesting because you have 75, 25, and 75, bringing us to 175 years in the life of Abram. So they all leave. And in verse 6 it says, And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem. And let me switch maps here and we will look at this. Let me zone in here. Okay. Abram would have come down through this route. He would have come down through here. And ended up right here at the place called Shechem. This would be in what you'll read in your Bible as the area of Samaria. Okay, you have Judea down around Jerusalem, you have Samaria, and then you have Galilee to the north, which is up here around the Sea of Galilee where Jesus spent most of his ministry. But he comes to Shechem unto the plain of Moreh. Now the word plain there is the Hebrew word Elon, which literally has been understood by scholars as meaning oak tree. So he comes to an oak tree of Moreh. The word Moreh, interestingly enough, in Hebrew means teacher. So he comes to an oak tree which is called teacher and that would have been understood as a place of divine oracles. You'll see this continually through the Old Testament. You will see a connection of meeting places between humans and God specifically on mountains, high places, and trees. So he comes to this tree near Shechem and it says in the, in the rest of that verse, it says, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Now, why would that be pointed out? Because the people that this is written to are about to go into the land and do what? kill the Canaanites. So it's pointing out that the Canaanite was in the land. So Abram comes to the land. He comes to this oak tree uh, of Moreh. And the Canaanites are in the land. And verse 7 says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. This is the first place in the Bible that it is specifically said that God appeared unto uh, one of the patriarchs. So he comes to this place of this tree and the Lord appears to him and says, to your seed I'll give this land. And he builds an altar unto the Lord. Why would he build an altar unto the Lord? as an expression of worship. He would have worshipped uh, Yahweh in that place. Now what's interesting about that is, see this word seed? 
Let me highlight it. The corresponding Hebrew word over here literally says to your seed, but it's singular. Which is interesting because why would it be singular? He says, unto your seed, singular, I will give this land. Have you ever wondered why, like, at the end of our Bible, in the book of Revelation, it has us, believers, and those who have died in faith throughout history, ending up where? In Jerusalem. So it shows us that the promise being made here is not only for the literal physical descendants of Abram, but this promise also reaches far beyond that into you and I, the church, who have been grafted in as the seed, the seed being Christ. Paul specifically mentions the fact that that the promise was made to his seed and his seed was singular. Paul points that out in his writings. And because of Christ, we are brought into that promise. Now, this had a temporal application in that God would take Abram's literal, physical, ethnic descendants, bring them to that land, and with them being in the land, he would bring to pass his promises. That's why Jesus was born when he was born while the Israelites were living in the land. But the promise still has a future eschatological application because you and I are promised to live in that land as well. Why? Because we are also descendants of Abraham. Because it's not just about ethnicity because Pentecost changed that. Jesus changed that. We've been grafted into the promise of Abraham, therefore we look into the future to the fulfillment of us obtaining that land, the land of promise. Have you ever wondered why that land is the most controversial, fought over land in all the world? It's not just an arbitrary coincidence. It is because God's name is there. It's because that's where it started and that's where it's going to end. Do you think the enemy knows that? Of course he does. Why do you think that he gathered uh, all of these rogue nations that the Israelites were to destroy and placed them in the land and around the land and the sons of God intermingled and surrounded the land of Israel with giants? Because they know that place is special to God. They know that God created man from that place. They know the garden was there. They know that God is going to bring His people back to that land. God's pretty predictable, believe it or not. That's what's so awesome about God. He's predictable. Why is He predictable? Because He doesn't change. Someone who doesn't change is going to be very predictable. But what's great about God is, as predictable as He is, He's unstoppable. And even though He uses imperfect divine beings in His plan and imperfect human beings in His plan, He still gets the desired end that He has promised and prophesied. Despite everything He creates working against Him at times and rebelling against Him. So, do you think Abram understood the gravity and the depth of the promise that's being promised to him? Do you think he understood the influence and the outreach of his decision to trust and believe God when he said, leave daddy's house, even though it's hard, even though it's painful, even though you're comfortable in Quran and go to a land that I'll show you along the way? Do you think he realized at that time how he would affect the world? And then you ask the question, what if he would not have? Let me ask you a question. What if you don't do what God's asked you to do? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, God should be we're listening, speaking to each and every one of us. 
to be a specific member of the body of Christ. To do a specific work for the sake of the kingdom of God. And so this is an appropriate time for us to self-reflect and say, Man, who will it affect if I faithfully respond or if I continually neglect, push aside, push off because it's not comfortable? Unfortunately, God doesn't ask us to do comfortable things. He stretches us. He asked us to do things that are out of our comfort zone. Things that we would not ordinarily do in and of ourselves, Unless we knew we had heard from the Creator. Are you following me? I hope I'm shocking some people uh, into a time of movement and a time of growth. Because we all want to procrastinate. I didn't have any of this in my notes, but I don't know who this is for. Maybe somebody listening, somebody that's sitting here. But we need to realize that our disobedience could greatly affect many people connected to our life. Amen. And we see that in this story. One man, one man in the ancient Near East chose to obey God and the world has been drastically influenced by that single decision. Or, I mean, does God love us any less than Abram? It may be possible that God has a plan for our lives like He did Abram's, where He wants to use us to be a channel of His blessing. And I believe that can be said of all of us. I'm going to read uh, some of the notes I have here on verse 7. This is the first recorded theophany. A theophany is a visible uh, manifestation of God in some type of physical, visible form because it says He appeared to Him. So this is the fir first recorded theophany to the patriarch Abram. Abram. He says, Unto your seed singular I will give this land. I believe this is a temporal promise that is for His natural seed through Isaac, the promised seed, but also for those who are in Christ, the seed, in an eschatological fulfillment. When I say eschatological, you do understand what I mean, right? Connected to the return of Christ and the consummation and bringing to pass the fullness of His promise and His kingdom. Okay, for the original audience of the writing... It should have provided motivation and built faith for the task that awaited them, which was the conquest of Canaan. Um, something that I want to point out is, in light of some of the things that I've mentioned, is the Crusaders in the medieval period misunderstood and misapplied the reality that the Abrahamic covenant and promise of the land belonged to the church in an eschatological reality. And they tried to bring that to pass themselves. The Crusaders came in uh, in the medieval period and they tried to, the Latin church tried to literally kill the Muslims and take over the land because they believed as quote unquote Christians that the land belonged to them because of the promise made to Abraham. And they misunderstood that that had a end goal, fulfillment in and through Christ. And they tried to apply Old Testament strategies of God using the Israelites to the New Testament era, which Jesus specifically told His disciples, hey, we're going to do things a little different. We're not going to fight with a sword. We're not going to resist uh, when people try to do us harm or evil. And they tried to go in and by force take the land, and we call it the Crusades. So they misunderstood um, the reality that this promise did flow over into the church. The end of that verse says, He built an altar unto the Lord and honored Him with uh, an offering. Verse 8, And He removed from there unto a mountain of the east of Bethel. Now let me pull this up here. And honestly, it's debated very much so on where Bethel is, but it says he leaves Shechem and he goes to Bethel, 
which is important because the Israelites whom this was written to would have understood in hindsight looking back that Bethel was a very significant place. We'll see that as we read along in Genesis because it is a place where Jacob, the grandson of whom we're talking about now, Abram, will have an encounter with God. And Bethel is taken from two words, bait, which means house, and el, which is the shortened form of the word for God, Elohim. So Beit El literally means house of God. We'll learn more about that uh, as we read through Genesis. But he comes to this location, and like I said, it is debated on where this is actually at, and it really it can't be proven. But it is south of Shechem towards what is known today as Jerusalem. So somewhere in this mountain range, there are some people who believe that Bethel is in Jerusalem. Uh, but that can't be proven. But it says, He removed from there unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built, he built an altar unto the Lord. And watch this. Watch the last part of this verse and just think about what it says when I read it. And called upon the name of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Does that word usage ring any bells? Let me read it again. And there he built an altar unto Yahweh and called upon the name of the Lord. Anyone? How about Romans 10? And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Romans 10. Evangelicals like to quote it a lot, but do they understand it? Does that mean we just acknowledge the existence of God? Is that what he was doing here? Just... Yahweh, you exist. No, he's trusting him. Why? How do we know that? Because he's proactively moving as God has spoken, as we read at the beginning of this narrative, that he responded to God in obedience, and he is moving through the land that God told him to go to. So, to call upon the name of the Lord would denote trust and obedience through tr true and loyal obedience and worship. And that's what he's doing here. He builds an altar to him to honor him. And he's calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, he's probably asking some questions. Right? He's surrounded by Canaanites. He's in a land that he's not totally familiar with. He's dealing with people groups that probably aren't excited about him being in the land. And you may ask why. Because Abram was very wealthy. He had a lot of souls with him, a lot of servants, a lot of slaves, and a lot of livestock. And so he's going through that land. And if you've been there, you know that the land is very sparse on what it is able to provide sustenance for. You know, you go to Israel and it's not just lush green pasture everywhere. It's few and far between. There's probably more, uh, more today than there was in antiquity because of man-made irrigation. But it's a desert climate. So the land was not just able to sustain his presence being there with that much substance. So he's calling upon the name of the Lord. And verse 9 says, And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. Literally there where it says toward the south, uh, literally he is going to the Negev. If you've been to Israel, you'll know that the Negev is the southern portion of Israel, which is nothing but desert. Okay, so he continues to move south. And you have to think that God is leading him because having been there, there is absolutely no reason to go to the Negev. 
unless you like a hard life. <laughs> There's nothing there but a desert. Verse 10 says, And there was a famine in the land. No, that's just how it is in the Negev. <laughs> but it says, There was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. So he goes there to stay for a duration while uh, the famine is on the land. And it says, For the famine, the famine was grievous in the land. So there is drought, Famine, food is scarce. He moves to Egypt. Why would he go to Egypt? Because Egypt is in a low place, valley, land, fertile land, a lot of water. And so he goes there to be sustained during the famine. Verse 11 says, It came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that you are a fair woman to look on. Now, let's stop and think about this for just a second. We just read that when he left Haran, he was 75. And we know, by reading ahead, we know that she is 10 years younger than him. So here's a 75-year-old man telling a 65-year-old woman, Hey, you're kind of hot. We're going to Egypt. And... That could be dangerous. And he goes on to say in verse 12, Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see you that they shall say, This is his wife and they will kill me, but they will save you alive. In other words, he says, Okay, you're really good looking. You may be 65, but you still have it going. She hasn't had kids at this point, obviously. And he says, all right, we have to go to Egypt because of the famine to survive. But the Egyptians are going to see you and they're, they're going to knock me in the head and take you to be their wife because you're gorgeous. Now he says in verse 13, Say, I pray thee, that you're my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake. Who, who are you worried about, Abram? I mean... Okay, say that she cooperates and says that she is his sister. Okay, that isn't necessarily going to stop them from taking her. It may save his life, but they still may take her. And if they take her, anyone want to guess what's going to happen? They're going to have sex with her. Why? Because she's gorgeous. And they don't fear God. So they're going to take her as a wife. But he's like, you know, God's made me this promise. And so, you know, we've got to kind of help God out. So here's the plan. We're going to go to Egypt. They're going to want you. We're going to lie. We're going to say that you're my sister. And they're not going to knock me in the head. So verse 13, Say, I pray thee that you're my sister, that it may be well with me for, for, for your sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Now what should he have done in this situation? Just trusted God. God made a promise. Right? And he should have just said, you know, God's made me a promise, and I'm just going to trust him. We're going to go to Egypt. We're going to stay there. We're going to wait this famine out. And then we're going to come back to the land that God promised me. But it doesn't happen that way. Because as all of us try to do, he tries to help God out. Like God needs his help to fulfill the prophecy that he has spoken over his life. So what is the motivating factor behind his decision to be deceptive? One word. I'm looking for one four-letter word. Fear. 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 What is the one thing that holds us back from fulfilling the plan of God? Fear. Fear. Fear of man. Proverbs says, The fear of man brings a snare. It's a trap. And there are a lot of people who have missed God's destiny for their life because of other things people and the fear that they allowed 
from what others may react, respond, fill in the blank. And that's exactly what's going on here. Now, the good news is it doesn't stop the, the plan of God or the promise of God. He makes a mistake, as we'll see here. Uh, so let's continue reading. Verse 14, And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very beautiful or fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. You want, you want me to uh, give you the translation of that? They go to Egypt. The Egyptians, uh, some of the princes of Egypt, see her and says, Good grief. And they go and they brag about her to Pharaoh. Well, the thing about that is Pharaoh gets what Pharaoh wants. Because he is the most powerful uh, human being uh, in the most powerful empire at that time. So they tell Pharaoh and they brag about her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now... I don't know about you, but Daniel's going to die before someone else takes my wife into their house. I would rather die than to watch or know that some other dude took my, my wife into their house and had sex with her. I, I'm going to die before that happens. You know, I'm not, I'm not worried about my life. I, I mean, it's not going to happen. And so it shows you that he's willing to compromise to save his own skin in a way that I, I feel like shows that he has uh, some character issues and he's very uh, self-centered to a degree, at least in this situation. It says, and, and here's how we know, verse 16. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. So Abram allows this to happen. He allows Pharaoh to take her into his house. Now the, now the scripture doesn't say that Pharaoh slept with her, but it's very likely and very probable based on what we read in verse 16 and 17. And he entreated Abram well for her sake. In other words, he was blessing Abram because she was in his house. Why would he do that? Just because she's in his house? Probably not. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses, men servants and maid servants, and she asses and camels that were given to Abram. In other words, Pharaoh gives Abram a lot of gifts because Abram is the brother, supposedly, of Sarai. In, in that culture of that day, what they did in, mar in marriage arrang arrangements is they blessed the family of the one espoused. He has intentions of marrying her. Now watch what verse 17 says. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Not because of Abram, but because of Sarai. Because she is the one being mistreated here and mishandled here. She is the one who has been taken by Pharaoh and she has been allowed by her husband to be taken into Pharaoh's house. He's blessed Abram because he allowed her to be taken. But watch what God does. God plagues Pharaoh's house and the word plague here would indicate some type of skin disorder because of Sarai. Now, if all he had done is take her into his house... Why would God plague Pharaoh and his house with great plagues if he had done nothing wrong other than take her into his house? I don't want to read too much into the text, but it's very likely that she was uh, abused and sexual activity took place there. Verse 18, watch what happens. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done unto me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? So we have to ask the question, How did, she, how did he know 
And I believe the answer based on the evidence that we're given here is Sarah probably finally spoke up because she probably didn't particularly like the situation she was in. Rightfully so. In the home of Pharaoh, given presumably to be married to Pharaoh, and, you know, we can only guess and speculate what has been done to her, but it causes her to cry out and to speak up. And God responds by plaguing Pharaoh's house. And Pharaoh confronts Abram and says, Why did you, not, why did you tell me that she was your sister? Verse 19. So I might have taken her to be for me a wife. Now, therefore, behold your wife. Take her and go your way. Even though Abram doesn't do the right thing, for her sake, God plagues Pharaoh's house and he says, you know what? Go. Verse 20, And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Now, here's where we see um, something that takes place in Abraham's life or Abram's life that actually happens to the Israelites, which are his descendants. There's a famine that causes Abram to wind up in Egypt. He goes to Egypt and leaves wealthier, just like the Israelites had just experienced. Remember, this, is, this revelation is given to Moses after the Exodus and what had just happened. The Israelites who had been in Egypt, who had went there because of the famine, while Jacob was alive, Joseph was there. They go down, they wind up staying in, in Egypt. Then they come out of Egypt, and as the Scripture tells us, they leave with all the silver and the gold, and all uh, the precious stones and substance. Same thing that happened with Abram. Now we're going to go into chapter 13 and... Start in verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Okay, so they come out of Egypt, if we're looking at the map, they come back into the Negev area, which is the southern part of Israel. Watch what it says in verse 2. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, from the Negev, even to Bethel. Okay? So he comes up through the Negev, and where does he go? Back up to Bethel. Why would he go back to Bethel? Anybody remember the last place where he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord? Bethel. He went from Bethel to Egypt. Perhaps he wasn't hearing God as much as he was. So he thought, you know what? How about I just go back to the last place I heard him? Because it's obviously reflected in his character and his actions when he gets to Egypt that he's not just totally following God's voice. Which is good news to you and I because it tells us even though we may struggle with the promise of God and we may struggle in obedience and morality and character issues, that as long as we'll continue to reach out and try to follow God, He will meet us and continue His plan. Thank God for that, right? So he goes back to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Verse 4, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. So the altar that he had made is still there. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. We see that same language that is borrowed and used in the New Testament. He calls upon the name of the Lord. Uh, I believe which is showing that he's saying, you know what, I think I'm going to trust you. I kind of messed up. I kind of ended up going down to Egypt kind of tried to get off in the flesh and do things my way to preserve the promise that you made, God. I was helping you out. But you know what? I think I'm going to go back to doing things your way. And we're going to see this cycle of 
Faithfulness, failure, faithfulness, failure, faithfulness, failure in his life. Now, verse 5 says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. So, because he is connected to Abram, what happens? He's blessed, because I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. Lot is blessed as well. Verse 6 says, And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. The reason why that is, is they're living in the little land of Israel, and if they're at the same location where he returns to Bethel, this area is desertous mountains. Okay? You have the Judean mountains through here, and so there's not just a whole lot of sustenance. You have Abram, who has a lot of cattle, a lot of livestock. You have Lot, who has a lot of livestock, and so things. And then you have the natives of the land. You have the Canaanites. It says um, that the land was not able to bear them, that they may dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And what happens as a result of that? There was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And then it points out, and the Canaanite and the Perizzites dwelled then in the land. Now, the way that's worded there has made scholars say, see, that, that is an addition of an editor that has to post-date Moses. Because when Moses writes any of his writings, they have not killed off any of the Canaanites or the people living in the land of Canaan. Uh, so this is a good indication that this possibly was added by an editor later on. So their herdsmen, their shepherds are fighting. And verse 8 says, Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and you, and between my herdmen and your herdmen, for we are brethren. In other words, we're kin. We are, we are brothers. You're my brother-in-law and my nephew. There's no sense in us having a falling out and fighting because we are too great for the land and there's not enough uh, provision for our herds. And so he tries to be a peacemaker. And he says in verse 9, Is not the whole land before, before you? Separate yourself, I pray thee, from me. If you will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you depart to the right hand, then I will go to the, le the left. Now, what does that mean? If you go to the left, I'll go to the right and vice versa. The left would be what? The north, northern Israel, to the right, would be southern Israel. Okay? He is, he is talking about, hey, we have the whole land before us. We'll just divide ourselves, separate ourselves, spread out. And he tells him, I'm going to let you choose. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. And he's trying to resolve the issue. Now watch what happens in verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes. Now remember, they're right here in these mountains. So they're in an elevated place. And they're talking about this. And it says that Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. Let me scroll up. Okay, where would that be? They're right here. It says he lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan. Where would that be? This area here. Okay? Now, basically what you have is the Judean mountains right here, which is a very elevated area. And then you have the Gilead mountains here in Jordan. So you have two elevated areas. And in between, what would you have? A valley? A lowland? Which would have what? The runoff of the water of the mountains. Therefore, it would be a very fertile, 
very lush, very green location, at least at this time. Okay? And so Lot being, you know, looking out for himself, he kind of looks around. And if you've been there, you can kind of visualize this. And he's looking to the north and the south. And he's like, man, all I see is mountains. He looks down in the valley and he's like, man, that's green down there. Jericho, that area down in there. And so looking out for himself and looking in the natural and the carnal, he's seen that the plain of Jordan was well watered everywhere. And notice what it says, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, which tells us that the destruction of the Sodom of Sodom and Gomorrah changed the topography because he says even as the garden of the Lord now if you've been to Israel you'll know that where the Dead Sea is and the Jordan Valley is the furthest thing from the garden of the Lord it is not a garden it is not a fruitful place it is a desert it is the lowest place on the earth which is where the Dead Sea is okay now this is what I believe and we'll see more about Sodom and Gomorrah as we read forward. But I believe at this time that this decision is made, I believe they are on the mountain there overlooking the Jordan Valley. And because of the runoff of the mountains, it is a valley that is fertile, that has great soil and, and sustenance for livestock or any, any type of life. This is before Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed. I believe that when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, it created what is now the Dead Sea. Which is the lowest place on planet Earth. Now, earlier I was thinking I need to upload a, a photo that we took uh, several years ago. I actually have a photo of Dylan overlooking uh, this area down around the Dead Sea. And you can see where uh, at some point there was a mass removal of land and shifting of the earth and I believe that it was a response to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and like I said we'll read this story later on because when you read the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah Lot's daughters thought the entire world was destroyed which tells you that it was a massive destruction I mean brimstone sulfur destroying these cities there in the plain. Uh, so something drastic took place. And I believe that the explanation is that at the setting of this story, you had at that time a lush valley that was full of produce, as it says, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you come to Soar, which is known to be fertile, uh, well-watered area. Um, Another thing that I want to point out in that verse, it says, even as the garden of the Lord. What would this be a reference to? The garden in Eden. But notice what it calls it. The garden of Yahweh. Why would he, call, why would he understand and write this as being at the garden of Eden being the garden of, uh, of Yahweh? Because he planted it, for one thing. And the garden functioned, as I've said before, as a cosmic sanctuary. Which was a place for an intersecting of the divine and the terrestrial. It was the place where God came and walked with Adam. It is also the place where the serpent, who was a divine being, by the way, not just a literal snake, deceived Adam and Eve there in the garden, which shows us that the garden was like a sanctuary. A sanctuary that has the opening eastward, right? Which way did Adam and Eve leave the garden? Eastward, which is going away from the presence of God. Why do you think the church, the church, the tabernacle, the temple, all of those places are called what? The house of God. Why are they called the house of God? Because they are the place of His presence. Are y'all following me? 
Verse 11, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. The word plain there is kikar, which literally means like a round, flattened area, which is different than what we've seen where it says the, the plain earlier, which actually should have been the oak tree. And then you have the English word plain again, which is a totally different Hebrew word. It's not elon. It's kikar, which is the plain of Jordan. And Lot, watch this. Don't miss this because this would have jumped out to the ancient reader. And Lot journeyed east. Just like we've seen Adam and Eve. They left the garden and went eastward. And Lot is choosing to leave going eastward. He's leaving the land of promise. And he's going into what looks like to the human eye, don't miss this, a better place. He is looking into the Jordan Valley, into a place that resembles the garden of God. But he's actually going away from the presence of God into the land there in the plain. We'll see this theme come up again and again where going eastward denotes going away from the promises, the covenant, the land that was promised. So Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other. Verse 12, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, the Kikar, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Again, moving away from the presence of God and the influence, a positive influence. Now, we'll see more about Sodom as we read in the future, so we're going to move on. Verse 14. This is a very pivotal verse in this narrative. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him. Remember, Abram had been here and the Lord had appeared unto him and made these promises to him. And then Abram leaves and he's not really hearing God's voice. He goes to Egypt. He's certainly not hearing God's voice. And then he says, you know what? I'm going to go back to the last place. I heard God's voice. And there the decision is made that him and, him and Lot will separate and part ways. And then it says, after that Lot was separated from him, that the Lord said, God starts speaking with him again. When? After Lot was separated from him. Lot, obviously, was looking in the natural and in the carnal. And the point that I want to make here is there are some people who may be carnal people in your life that are stopping God's promise from being fulfilled in your life. God didn't say another word to Abram until Lot was out of his way. That's why Paul says... Evil communications corrupt good manners. It can pull us away from the things of God and it can influence us in a way that we begin to be carnally minded instead of focused on God's promise. So after Lot's gone, he says, Lift up now your eyes. Look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Notice he gives more details. For all the land which you see, to you will I give it and to your seed forever. Wow. The promise gets better and more detailed. He says, I'll give it to you and your seed forever. So let me ask you a question. Do the Jews have a right to, to be in Israel? Oh, yeah. We have to have, ask the question, does forever mean forever? It does. And so that land belongs to uh, the Hebrew people. 
He says, For all the land which you see, to you will I give, to your seed forever. And I will make your seed. He gets even more detailed. I will, give, I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. Now, this is a pretty bold promise to a guy who's 75 and ain't had a kid. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall your seed also be numbered. So we see here again, just like we've seen earlier, this promise has a immediate fulfillment through Isaac and the descendants uh, of Jacob, the Israelites who develop into a nation of Hebrew people. But it also has a future fulfillment that we have been grafted into and this will apply to us as well. He said, you, you, will be, you will have a multitude of seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall your seed also be numbered. And then he says, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto you. And, and basically, him walking through the land would, would be uh, symbolic of taking legal possession of the land. Verse 18, Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. If we want to go to our map, he had come up from Egypt to this area here, and he comes back down to the area of Hebron, and this is where he builds an altar unto the Lord. Notice as the word plain again, looking at this screen, the word plain there is the word elon, which is an oak tree or some type of an oak tree. So he, he comes to an oak tree in Mamre, which is in Hebron, which is in a mountainous range, by the way. So notice we have him going to mountain areas to worship or build an altar or near trees. We see this theme all throughout the Old Testament. That was part of their culture and understanding of where God would visit man. So there he builds an altar unto the Lord as a form of worship. We're going to stop right there and we're going to give everyone an opportunity to ask questions if they have any questions. Why did who why, allow? Why did, why did Abraham go ahead and take Lot with him? Leave? Family pressure. I mean, you have to think about who Lot is. Lot is his brother-in-law and his nephew. I mean, so he's double kin. And so, you know, like a lot of families do, they let someone in the family tag along. This person just happens to be someone who's very carnal, who kind of hinders the plan of God for a season. And until he's removed out of the inner circle of Abram's life, God stops talking, stops appearing. And we see that Abram's character is not as upright as what we've seen prior to this in the narrative. Which tells us that there are some people, family or not, that you can't have up in your inner circle. Because who you hang around will influence you. And that's why we need to guard who we allow to be close up into our lives. It doesn't mean we're, we, we become separatist and we don't get out and about. Obviously, we're called to the world to be the light of the world. So, you know, we have to get out amongst people. But I'm talking about who you allow in your day, day in, day out inner circle. Who's speaking into your life. Who's influencing your life. And we have to be careful who we allow, whether they're family or not. Peggy? Yeah, in verse 19, where he says, why do you say she is my sister? Am I not taking her as my wife? So, that isn't clarifying that she did not, that Pharaoh probably did have sex with her. Even though he says here, I might have taken her for my wife. 
um, it, the passage isn't clear whether or not a sexual act took place. He makes the statement, I was going to marry her, yeah. is, is how we should understand that. I was going to marry her because you told me she was your sister. And she really was his half-sister. Not really. Not really. I mean, she was his and he was his dad's. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were kin, obviously, yeah. but he was being deceptive. There's, there's, there's no way around that. And the, and it's clear that the author is not speaking in a favorable way uh, about what has taken place here. Um, I mean, you have to understand the culture of the Egyptians. They were very sexual. They were very. They obviously were not Yahweh fears. They worship many gods. Um, I mean, it's likely that something inappropriate took place because why else would Sarah speak up so that he knew that you know she wasn't his sister she was his wife and why else would God plague Pharaoh if Pharaoh simply took her in his house and had no intentions of any wrongdoing wouldn't it be unjust for God to punish Pharaoh who took a man at his word and blessed and on top of that he blessed Abram I mean you have to you have to think about it and say man what would cause Pharaoh to honor Abram in such an extravagant way that he leaves with gold silver manservants and maidservants slaves more people more substance more livestock more sheep more camels uh, if he had simply just let Sarah, you know, kind of stay the night at Pharaoh's house. I mean, obviously, we, you know, we got to be careful about not reading too far into it, but the evidence would indicate that something inappropriate was taking place or was about to take place or was in the process of taking place when she spoke up and God said, you know what, I'm going to plague for her sake, not jerk, because he's only worried about himself. But because of her, which shows you how important she is in the promise, even though it's made to Abraham as the spiritual leader of the home, it also is for her too, because Abram cannot fulfill the promise without Sarah. And so she's directly connected and involved in the promise, even though it was not specifically addressed and made to her. He cannot fulfill the promise without her. And therefore, I believe God acted on her behalf, you know, and got him out of a bind. And thank God for it. You kind of got to feel bad for Sarah because, I mean, it was such a culture where they had to just basically do what the man said. I mean, You have to think that she also would have been thinking, I don't want Abram dead either. So she probably would have been along the same rationale of, you know, I'd rather possibly be slept with by someone else than to be without a husband and permanently, permanently in Pharaoh's house. Because here's the reality. If, if, if Abram's killed, she becomes property of Pharaoh so undoubtedly it would have been a, a tough situation to be in Gary Verse 10. chapter 12 Chapter 13. 13 sorry. No problem. I didn't write that. Uh, Garden of Yeah, there. Uh, it, it is the, after we, you made a great dissertation on the Garden of the Lord, but then after that it says, Like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. It, is that making another comparison about the Garden of Eden? It's making another comparison of what the valley of Jordan would have looked like. It was like the garden of the Lord 
fertile, producing, lush, just like. And he's giving an example that they would have been familiar with so that they could mentally connect visually because obviously they had never seen the garden of the Lord, but they had been to Egypt. So it makes sense that the author writing to a people group that had just been rescued from Egypt would have said, oh, yeah, at that time, the, the plain of Jordan was like Soar. Y'all all remembered Soar. We just walked through it not that long ago. That's why he chose to go there. Because he was looking with the natural eye and he chose to go there. Any others? It's pretty straightforward. Some of these chapters that we'll go through are pretty straightforward and don't need a whole lot of explanation other than what we give as we go through it. So uh, stay with me as we continue to go through some of the chapters. I mean, at times we're going to go through chapters that are less action-packed and revelatory than others. Uh, but they're in our Bible, which means they're inspired of God, and that means they're important. And just like some of the things that we've pointed out tonight, there are so many ways where our life is the same as the patriarchs, Abraham, Sarah's. They face difficulty. They face decisions where they're going to be put in a position to trust God or not. And those decisions are going to affect a whole lot more people than they realized. And, and the same goes for us. Our decisions to trust and obey God do not only affect us, they affect many others as well. So, no more questions? I want to thank everybody for joining in to our study tonight. And next week we'll jump into chapter 14. And we'll look at Lot being rescued by Abram.